It looks like they're all uh, in a Star Wars stupor. They're entranced. I think they're afraid to do anything. They're just trying to put it up and and hoping, you know, that the other side will make an error. Yeah. That would be a mistake if they continued under that delusion for Benji and Louis. Because Charlie, and if he gets a little support from Jose, which it looks like he won't, this is just uh, words in the wind. It has no bearing on what this game is all about. The beautiful part about it is that the tournament is being held. We used to have an indoor nationals as opposed to the outdoor nationals. And we had the same group of fellows who really played well. But uh, the facility here is not that accessible anymore. And therefore, we're limiting it to two successive Sundays. We're down here in Coney Island at 35th Street and Surf Avenue. This is formerly the Hirschman YMCA. It is now called the Atlantic Handball Association. And they have many other activities in this facility, basketball and various services for the elderly. But the, the owner, Larry Kadish, has made uh, this place available for handball because he is a handball player. As a matter of fact, on the far court, the referee in the white cap, if you'll take a second to pan over there, uh, that's his son, Howie Kadish. And Howie Kadish remarkably won the, the last invitational doubles here. He had no chance to win against the top players, and miraculously, in quotes, La uh, Howie Kadish and Fred Sylvia went on to win the uh, finals. They're going to be in this tournament too, so we'll see whether or not it's going to be a fluke or not. They played against the likes of Gerso and uh, Albert Apuzzi, and also uh, Eddie Golden and Buddy Gant, all oh, pretty much the top names in the doubles field. Uh, it was a one-day tournament, and the finals was a 15-point game, 15, 15, and 15, if there were a tiebreaker. And with that, the other fellas, the top competitors, thought that their opponents weren't really up to their skill level. They just kept the ball in play, hoping to win it. And Kadish went for the definitive shots and not only won the critical point to get the serve, but went on to win the game-winning point. It's really amazing. I have a question. I was, I was looking at old tapes of you and, and Vic Herskowitz and your brother, and part of what I noticed is there was a much more intense and aggressive attitude toward the game in the 50s and 60s. Um, of course, we are looking at a preliminary match, but I just wonder, has the sheer level of concentration, of mental concentration in handball, has it gone down in 30, 40 years? You yeah. yeah. raise another interesting question. Since the level of competition has somewhat diminished, the amount of uh, desire has also diminished. What's happening is there's been a transition in sports, racquetball also, where you just go through the motions now. You just whack at the ball without any thought mm -hmm. of uh, thinking about a game plan, about using your partner as a pick, say, in doubles and things like that. They just get out, whack it, and whoever survives wins. That's unfortunate. In the 50s and 60s, as you said, the skill level and the depth of players was so tremendous yeah. that you had to be on your toes all the time just to survive. We had people, uh, there were 16 teams in doubles and 16 top competitors in singles, and any one of them could have risen to the top. Because of that change over the years, because the change in the economy, because of people's attitudes about handball, you know, perhaps hurting their hand instead of going on, uh, Benji and Louie finally won this match just by sheer uh, inertia rather than doing anything dramatic to get them over the, the victory line. But to, just to close out the question, you can't take anything away from Charlie Sheldon and Jose Medina. They did as best they could at what they do. Now the camera is focusing to the far court. We have another qualifying round on here today. And uh, the fellow with the uh, goggles, with his hands on his hips, is David Sheldon, who happens to be Charlie Sheldon's father. Uh, watch him, and you won't see the, the same type of play that Charlie engages in. He's more aggressive than his father. He's younger, he's stronger. His partner in the yellow shirt is Robert Sastry, who had won the Budweiser Paddleball Championship, like five out of the six years. He decided to go into handball. In his first try, he won the 19 and under championship. In his second try last year, he came in second. Uh, 
Uh, his partner, his opponent there with the white headband is Willie. Terrific player. He's, he, you mentioned aggressiveness. This guy is the epitome of aggressiveness. He's got his eye on the ball. Just a tremendous player. Focuses his attention. He really spirits his, his partner. I've got a question. Is yeah. there are certain players like Vic Hershkowitz and Steve Sam who have a kind of an ursine look. They're like tremendously large bears. They uh -huh. overpower the pool. Yeah. And then there are guys like you who are the willowy type. Um, is there a physique to handball? And are, are there certain kinds of attitudes that come with a certain kind of a physique? Like a Hershkowitz is an overpowering player in the same way as obviously because they try to use their upper body. Um, but is, is the willowy style, is it, is it a better style? Can you move better? Can you get position? You have the tremendous ability, Matthew, of always asking the penetrating questions. Uh, let me put it to you this way. I wish you hadn't said my, my frame is willowy. It's more lean and mean. But you only see me now in the 60s. I was a very powerful guy with a broad chest, too, and very powerful shoulders and arms and powerful legs, the legs to drive you to the shot and the upper frame in order to move the ball. Vic Hershkowitz, in, in his prime, looked like a bear because he was about five foot seven. He was a very powerful man. He didn't have to move that rapidly because his sense of anticipation was very great. My brother Oscar was about the same height, but Oscar was pure muscle and two-handed velocity where he could power that ball with such intensity that his opponents basically would just barely be able to get the ball back, at which point Oscar would go in and kill the ball. Berskowitz at the other hand didn't have that overwhelming power. He was a couple of shades less in intensity, but he had the ability to move the ball with both hands very cleverly to get his opponent off balance and then make the move in order to get the game uh, and uh, shot making play, say a kill shot or a, a low shot to either corner. Now putting this into perspective, as I told you before, the players today don't have that game plan type of skill. They're more a function of being taller and being more powerful. And it came out in the last uh, United States Handball Association magazine talking about uh, John Bike's performance in winning the singles and doubles in the four wall and singles and doubles in the three wall. They alluded to the fact that if his opponents had only about five or ten more pounds more on their frame at the beginning of the tournament, they may have given, given him trouble at the end of the tournament. So, bringing your question full circle, the difference is, I go for the man like this fellow that you see right on the court now, his name is Emilio. He's tall, lean and mean, two wonderful arms. Uh, unfortunately, his uh, disadvantage is he's so in awe of the way he powders the ball with both hands. He gets into trouble where even a steady player like a Charlie Sheldon would keep volleying and keeping the ball in play would tend to frustrate him. Since he's so lean and mean, if another player with five or ten pounds on his frame and just stick to it if this would continue to punish him by moving him around, then you may find out that Emilio will get frustrated and tired, and his opponent, who doesn't have the degree of skill level with both hands, will find himself coming in second. It happened in the uh, PSAL championship where Emilio was touted to be the guy to win the championship to take the coveted uh, award from the high school uh, uh, tournaments and unfortunately he came in second. It wasn't all his fault though, they played on the court in Central Park which had asphalt and over the years the heat hits the asphalt, made a little dip over the short line and his opponent was able to hit the ball over the short line, hit the dip and frustrate Emilio. When Emilio finally got the ball back in play, his opponent from the high school of science didn't have a very strong left. Emilio would win those volleys because he had two better hands and a better volley game. But unfortunately, his opponent kept hitting the ball over the short line into the dip and was able to win the championship. Uh, I look forward to seeing those two in competition in the nationals in the future. And then we'll see whether or not his opponent who had won the championship had developed his left hand in the interim. And then you're going to see a really tremendous game. The fellas you're seeing now is uh, Benji and Louie, who had won the last match. It looks like they'll be playing Emilio and Joe Malkus, who's touted to be the next superstar. Unfortunately, he likes to eat. Uh, he loves to hear good things about himself. 
He has been in the higher levels of play with some of the better players. He has mastered some wonderful shots. I told him not to swing sidearm with his opposite hand. I trained him for a long while. Now that he thinks he's a superstar, he's going to keep hitting the ball with his left hand. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is a drawback. Okay. Gets into your bloodstream, gets down to your legs, and your legs aren't able to move as well as they were had you only drunk some water rather than some carbonated oh. soda. I think they want that sugar hit. You know, they're feeling a lack of energy, and they want that that hit of sugar that makes them feel as if they're energized. No, they just get used to drinking soda all the time. And that's unfortunate. To play this game, you have to be in shape, as we mentioned throughout. And the way to stay in shape is to eat the correct food. These are two teenagers. They're still in the, uh, the garbage syndrome of food nutrition. They'll take whatever's available, and unfortunately, ultimately, it will affect their hand. And, uh, Score is 9-4, second, second man. I believe too, as I said before, Emilio just started off too fast. I don't think Joe Malkus and Emilio should have switched sides. I think they should have stayed where they were to try and stabilize and get into the action of the game by changing at a moment where it's totally unnecessary because that was the feeling out part of the game. They may have dug themselves a hole. The saving grace will be uh, Emilio's youth. The fact that Benji and Louie have put out some energy in the preceding game, even though it wasn't too much. But I think the key to Emilio's success will be whether or not Joe Mal Malkus can keep his delusions of ending the volley and just stay in a mode where he's keeping the ball in play. Now, unfortunately, when Emilio goes for that shot and misses, this puts more pressure on Malthus to think he has to take over. And speaking of that, how come he wasn't over on the right, which was illogical? If, if Emilio had made that shot, it seems to me Joe should have been over on the right to pick up a, uh, a return. He's kind of like standing around watching. This, this is really interesting. Emilio seems to miss no matter where he is. He's definitely not. And I think it may be this camera, unfortunately. I hope it isn't us. Because the skill of Benji and Louie at this level shouldn't be that pronounced. They are equal to each other, with the one exception if Joe Malthus assumes the reins without being realistic about it. You see, if your stronger partner misses a couple, that's no reason for you to switch sides. It may be a reason to take a time out and then encourage them. But we'll see what happens. Well, you know, if if I were Joe and Emilio, I would say these guys have to be attacked. You can't just let them volley because they're going to win. They're, they're too strong. It, it, how, how, how would you approach them? How, how would you attack the brothers? It's, it's very, fairly simple. What you want to do is think about the aggressor on the team, Louie, yeah. and freeze him out. Because the aggressor on the team, being the aggressor, who always thinks that he's in charge. So by cleverly freezing him out, you frustrate him, and then he starts trying to take more and more of the shots, because Benji can't hurt you. Right. Now on the serve, in order to get Louis out of the play, it may sometimes just be a fooler to get him off track, thinking at one point you're freezing him out. I would try a, a cross court high serve to Louis' right hand, which bounces near his foot. Gotcha. You see, these guys who are powerful from the waist down are very poor players from the waist up. So if you can change the speed of the ball to get their timing out and to raise it to a higher level, mean, meaning a higher level on the wall, they're not used to those types of shots. These players could be destroyed by bringing them into the short line and then all of a sudden putting a ball over their heads where they have to backtrack and raise their arms. I've seen them very poorly play that type of game. But that in essence is the way you would play the brothers. Benji can't hurt you, so you just keep the ball to him. 
that pleases his brother Louie out. He gets a little more concerned that Benji's not doing anything. And if you keep hitting the ball to Benji long enough, ultimately he gives you the shot. Right. Then your partner who come on, be a See what the score is. The score is 13-7. Not too shabby, based on the way the uh, Emilio and Joe Malthus team has played so far. He's getting mad. You see now he's totally frustrated. He was frustrated when Emilio was missing. That put him on the left side, which is the strong side. And now he's over there, and he doesn't have the skill in order to put him in the pressure on, on Benji and Louis. Could I ask you, on a day where you find that you aren't executing your shots and everybody has a day like that, how do you deal with that? <laughs> it's strange that you made that statement. This is the honest truth. I've never had a day where I wasn't executing my shots. You know why? No. Because when I'm not playing in matches or in games, I'm always practicing. I'm always stroking the ball and trying to get my hand-eye coordination going. So for other people who have had bad days, you can take it one of two ways. You take a time out, you try and rethink what you're doing, and that will sort of settle the tone of the match down. It also settles down your opponents who may be aggressive. Remember I told you that long story about being in trouble at point game and my opponent had the momentum having scored the three points. I just called three timeouts in a row. To the uh, Romarians, we need to say three times out or three timeouts. I think in handball, we say three timeouts. But as this game is unfolding now, because Amelia is finding a pattern, assuming he doesn't go for the shot. See, on the right side, you can't go for the shot. He was off balance. He couldn't really get his whole body into that shot. He goes in that position. Not that he's so frustrated, he really doesn't know what he's doing. Having been put there for the wrong reason on the right side, he should have been doing now what Malkus should have been doing, keeping the ball in play, keeping his opponents off balance, and being a strong enough hard hitter that he hits a particular shot at a slight angle toward the middle, it'll bounce between the brothers and they'll collide with each other trying to play the ball. He doesn't have to go for the definitive shot on the line or a low kill shot. With his power from this angle, that would be destructive enough. But he's a young man, he's feeling his way through the, uh, the annals and through the levels of handball. And hopefully he'll, he'll pick it up this time. He looks very unhappy. Yeah. I don't know if his girlfriend is here, but sometimes that's a fact. You play great in the local park, you bring your girlfriend along, and then what happens is you want to rise and shine to the occasion, and it becomes counterproductive. There's many times in the past that great champions had their fathers at the tournaments, and the fathers, in one case, was actually standing by the front wall as the son was playing, actually micromanaging his son's performance, and invariably, Three people I'm thinking of, all their sons lost because they couldn't take the pressure of the fathers being there. And it, it wasn't even like a verbal exchange. The kid would actually miss and just automatically look over his father for approval or disapproval. And in most cases, it was disapproval and he couldn't go on to function. Even <laughs> though those players had tremendous talent, but it could never show because of the influence of the father. That is truly remarkable. Has your father ever come down to watch you and your brothers play? I'm glad you said that, and that's why I set this up. <laughs> My father traveled with us all over the country. But you know what his one skill was? His one skill was just watching and enjoying the game. He would watch and enjoy the game. And we, if we would miss a shot, which wasn't too frequent, maybe that's another reason, <laughs> he would be in our corner the whole time. His one main positive influence was always encouraging us to play ball. When a person is missing, he knows he's missing, so that's not the time to add a negative note. You come over and you say, don't worry about it, cheer him up, come on, you can do it, and don't use any specific things like, uh, make that low serve, make that low shot. Encourage them in general, and it works wonders and magic. Now let's see, we've lost a little sight of the score here, after this next volley. Let's see what's happening. You see how the game is now stabilizing? 
I don't see any kind of energy or intensity from Emilio and Joe. It seems to me they're uh, pretty demoralized. Yes, and rightfully so. They just announced the score. It's 21 7. The kid hit it with his left hand side on. In my sessions with him, I said, just get the ball back with your left hand. Now, whether he's frustrated or not, it's totally irrelevant. How do you deal with 21 7? Do you attack him and say, well, I have the freedom to take a lot of chances, it's my own, it's my own shot. Or do you try to be absolutely defensive and try to make the errors the other side? At this age, Marcus and his partner Emilio don't have the skill or the sight to control in order to stay in the game. If you had the emotional control, you would still stay in the game.